I hope that you're liking this format, these smaller kind of segments instead of sitting for an hour. We know that sometimes that's necessary, but we just thought we'd try something new. Um, from a timing perspective, it's a little stressful, just going to tell you. <laughs> so this afternoon, we kind of wanted to talk about the ARPA and CARES, which I know you guys are just loving talking about, right? I do have a question. How many of you guys, because I haven't looked this up, were not federal until you received CARES money? Is there anybody in here? You back there? OK. That's interesting. Just kind of curious. All right. So as a reminder, you know, we're a post-audit agency. We come in and we look at your records after the fact. Which can be confusing because, you know, we're looking at what your grantor agencies have told you you can spend your money on and we're auditing against that. So I kind of wanted to preference this whole conversation as this is not a what can you spend with this money kind of a thing. I can't tell you that. Okay. Uh, what I can do is lead you towards the guidance and what you need to do uh, to satisfy that. Okay. So how many in here have been through a CARES actual federal grant audit. Okay. All right. You're, you guys are going to get ready to here shortly. Okay. All right. So we knew CARES was, oh, CARES. ARP is going to be the same thing, but we got several years on that. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's true. So in the CARES portion, we're auditing it. So if you have been audited, uh, chances are it's going to be the major federal program. So what we thought we would do is talk about what we're looking for during the audit of these funds, okay? So we're going to start off with CARES. And one of the first things we're looking for is, is a separate fund? Has it been created, okay? We issued guidance. Well, we issued lots of guidance last year. It was kind of a moving target. Right? I, saw, I heard some chuckles. So, yeah, it was kind of a moving target, but we were trying to um, make it work. And as new guidance came out for us, we were trying to be adjusting as we were going along. Um, in the beginning, we did issue a range of numbers because we did know you were going to get multiple grants that fell underneath CARES. You know, CARES is just the umbrella that holds it. Uh, the main one that you're most likely thinking is the, um, the relief fund, the coronavirus relief fund that was uh, administered through IFA. So what we're looking for here is that you're not commingling the money. That was kind of a big thing in the spring we talked about, you know, any kind of grants, um, state, federal, all need their own separate fund. We shouldn't be commingling them with other funds. We need to be able to identify what funds are in there. So looking for the separate fund within the range. We're also looking to see if there was a zero balance, okay, at the end. Not everybody had a zero balance at the end of 2020 because some of you didn't get reimbursements till January, right? And does anybody have a zero balance at the end of December? Ooh, I see a couple. Okay, I see a couple. I know a lot turned them in, got them in in time. It's just you didn't get that reimbursement request until January. So in that case, when we come back to do the 20. 21 audit, that's what we're going to be looking for. We're going to look to make sure that everything has, the transactions have all, all the accounting of the transactions, and that that fund equals zero. Okay? So, not only are we looking for those, we're also auditing against the compliance supplement. Does everybody know what the compliance supplement is? Anybody know what it is besides Lori? <laughs> All right, so the compliance supplement is what we use to audit all federal grants. Okay, they issue one every year. I think the new one came out in July, I think, this year. Don't quote me on that one. Um, so. It is separated into kind of the begin a couple different sections. The beginning of it is what applies across the board to every federal grant that's out there. It tells us what we need to look at. Sometimes you get grants that have specific guidance, and those are pulled out, and they have their own specific guidance within that compliance supplement. 
the first part that applies to everybody still applies, but you have to consider what the, the nuances, the little differences are between those grants, okay? That is what we use to audit every federal grant that you guys have. What is applicable, okay? What are they looking for? What, you know, what was that grant allowed to be spent for? So we go through that, and we do have a federal team that kind of helps us sort out which grants and which compliance requirements um, apply. For this, for the CARES grant, really there could be more, but most likely the allowable activities, allowable costs, period of performance, and reporting. Those are the four that we are mainly going to look at. You could have additional inside there, but just as an overall, those are the, those are the big four. So um, allowable activities and allowable costs kind of go hand in hand. What are you spending your money on? Is it allowed through that grant? Okay, we're gonna take a look at that. We're gonna pull those and see. Period of performance is kind of like a, a time frame. You know, how much time did you have to spend that money? Um, you know, wasn't it an advance grant? Most of the time with advance grants, when you get it, you have to spend it almost immediately. This is not ARPA, ARPA's different, <laughs> so don't take that. But, um, or is it a reimbursement grant where you've spent the money, but you should have spent the money in a certain period of time? So maybe it was January through December of 21. You needed to have spent that money during that time frame. So we're looking at those kinds of things. And reporting is what required reports are there for that grant? Did you do them? Okay, were they accurate? Those kinds. So anyway, those are the things that we're looking for when we're actually testing at the federal, you know, for the federal grant itself. And again, each CARES, under the CARES umbrella, each grant could just have little nuances that are a little bit different. All right, so that's that federal grant portion. Well, with CARES, you know, we issue the guidance on how you account for all of that money as well. So while the compliance supplement, that's something we look at, we also are going to be looking at State Examiner Directive 2020-3, which I don't know if you all remember this, but last year when we did this hybrid thing, Lori and I weren't here, I did a whole presentation on CARES. We had issued this directive like three days before I had to give the presentation, which meant I was scrambling to change slides. I missed stuff um, as we were changing some of our guidance. So, but hasn't changed since it stayed <laughs> at this point. So the things that we're looking at through this, uh, through this directive are, um, again, the non-payroll costs re reimbursed. Okay, did those come from an appropriated fund? All right, if they did come from an appropriated fund, when you got that reimbursement, did you move the expense? Did you put the reimbursement into the separate fund and then did you move the expense to basically zero out that transaction. Again, these are for the non-payroll. And was it a timely posting? Meaning, well, you know, we spent it out of general fund. We, in, let's say, March. We got the reimbursement, let's say, June, but eh, we didn't do anything on the transaction side till December. That's not really timely, okay? We, were, we are looking for a timely, um, a timely movement of that. So you get it, you move it, okay? All right, so the payroll costs, which were a majority, I think. I think most people started, or most counties started doing the non-payroll costs, and then when they opened it up to this, this was the, really the easier way to do it, right? You just submit more than what you could request, and you're going to get it back. Well, you know, we came down, and we talked about it, and we were trying to figure out what is the easiest way to account for it. And it First, we thought, well, you know what, we'll just do the movement of the expenses like we did the other, right? Keep it all very simple. But we wanted to give you guys that money back, like as far as back into that general fund, give you back that appropriation, put that cash into that balance. So we came up with the ordinance. Okay, so when we come in, we're going to look. Which option in the directive did you pick? Did the county decide, you know what, we're going to go ahead and just move the expenses back? move the expenses to that CARES fund, zero it out, or for these payroll costs, do we decide we're going to do option two? So if you did option two, we're looking for the ordinance that the commissioners would have passed, okay? 
So the ordinance is going to state that you're going to basically do option two. You're going to move by claim that payroll to the general fund, general fund only. Okay. So we are looking for that stuff specifically as well. Um, I lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> All right, so if we did the ordinance um, by claim to the general fund, those do need to be, when we go in to look at that transfer, we are going to look that the reimbursement matches up with the payroll cost, kind of. We know it's not going to be exact because you could submit more than what your reimbursement is, but we are looking for that, okay, and making sure um, that that agrees. Okay, which I kind of already touched on this, and that was kind of the zero, the zero balance. So regardless of which option you picked, the end goal is that the CARES fund is zero, right? So if you moved your expenses over, you would zero, it's going to end up zeroing out the reimbursement, right? So I spent all this money out of, let's say, the health fund. I turned all that in for reimbursement. I put the reimbursement over here. I move the claims that I asked for reimbursement into the CARES fund, zero, right? So we're, that's what we are looking for. And again, we're looking for uh, the, time, the timeliness of it. I will say one thing that we have been asked a lot um, after you guys have received the second reimbursement or the last reimbursement part, maybe in January or so, we still get questions about, well, now what do we do with the CARES money? We've got this CARES money. It was a reimbursement of expenses. If you chose option two and you have an ordinance and you have moved those payroll costs to general fund, it is no longer grant money. It is general fund money. Okay? So it would follow all your normal appropriation procedures that you would go through with, for with any of your general fund money. I'm going to repeat it because. The council seems to want to keep track of like that money and how much of it's spent for uh, um, vaccine clinic and other COVID related stuff. So I probably shouldn't be doing this, but we. They've been doing appropriations back into a, a coronavirus fund and then expending it from that. Uh, for you, I'm sorry, I'm, like, I didn't understand part of what you said. Can you repeat well, it? Essentially, they're, they're, they kept that. that f Are you moving to a separate fund or a separate account, like a line item? Uh, a, a separate fund that was the, that, so that they can still show those expenses flowing through one area as a means of keeping track of it. They've asked for that, essentially. So. It should be in general fund. It I mean, I'm just going to say that. It should be in general fund. fund. Yeah. I mean, if they wanted to appropriate a certain line item in general fund, and that's kind of how they wanted to keep track of what they were spending through the year, I mean, it's still within general fund. But, again, it loses its identity once. We, you know, you heard Tara talk about not commingling, not transferring money. Once you put it all into general fund, it loses its identity. You can't really track you know, as a balance wise, which we didn't need to, because again, you're being reimbursed for costs you already spent. Okay. All right, so I'm just, as anybody, so we've got some people who have been audited on this grant in particular, right? Has there been any, um, any issues that you saw that I didn't cover? None? I do have one. Interlocal agreements with those libraries and townships. Uh, so they're looking at, so if you pass money on into, okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't think about that one when I was doing this presentation, just because I know that a lot were like, oh, we can do payroll. So I, you know, we're just going to do payroll. So yes, if you did pass money on to 
um, a library or a township or anything like that. We would be looking for an agreement between, between the two, just like you would if you were doing any other, you know, um, I can't even think of the word, working togethers. Why not? I feel really bad for these people online. I am so sorry. <laughs> just don't look up my nose. Um, it's just not a flattering angle. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> okay. All right. So, has anybody had any findings on, besides maybe interlocal, I don't know, any findings on CARES where they had to do a corrective action plan or anything like that? I see some nodding. Okay. If you need help with that, contact us. I mean, we'll, we'll be more than happy to talk with you. Um, I know that there's the accounting for this. Again, it was a moving target. It started one way, and we just kind of kept trying to adjust uh, to get there. But Lori and I will be happy to sit down with you, talk about what happened in your county, what maybe adjustments need to be made to get that to a zero. But just call us, let us know, okay, and we can have that conversation. I know this is what you really want to talk about, though. <laughs> the ARP. So I really wanted to talk about it from an audit standpoint. Again, you know, as I said in the beginning, we're a post-audit agency. I cannot give you permission to spend anything. Okay? Your grant tour agency can tell you what you can spend, and we use their guidance to audit against. Okay? So just keep that in mind as we go through all of this. We met in May, and we did talk a little bit, but not a whole lot um, about this. I think we touched on it just really briefly. Stuff was still coming out. Uh, we did issue the state examiner directive in uh, March, maybe. Sorry, it's really small on my screen. In March, maybe. Um, and so we thought, OK, this will be for the accounting procedures for federal assistance. Again, we're hoping. This really hasn't changed, though. I mean, it's pretty much kind of stayed the same. We do have other guidance that has come out, you know, about interest and things like that, and we've put out other memos. Every memo that we had about CARES and about this is on our web page. It was, at one point last year, just listed at the bottom. I mean, that list just kept growing. We've now kind of accordioned them. So if you kind of scroll down kind of to the middle of the page, it's separated. There's kind of a, a, a CARES, and then there's an ARPA. And there's a kind of, I think, a plus next to it. If you open that, it will, the guidance for each one of those, since they are separate. So anything that I mention here is on, on our website. OK. so. ARPA, ARP, everybody calls it different uh, stuff, right? It is, again, the umbrella. So what I'm specifically going to talk about is the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds. Or I've seen that FRF. I don't know what we're calling it. Just, But this is what we're specifically talking about today. I do want to make sure, because there are different ARP funds that are coming out, um, I think, what was it, one of, for the uh, wastewater, IFA's got a SWIFT grant, maybe, if that's what it's called. You're shaking your head, so I'm right. Okay. Um, so they've got some of that coming out, uh, things like that. Okay. So, again, separate fund is required. We issued this fund range up here. Uh, for any of those, um, for any grants that fall under the ARP. We're going to be looking for the ordinance. The ordinance should specify the use in accordance with the 603C of um, the plan. And we do want to talk about appropriations. So originally we came out and said, you know, it does, it takes local appropriation. Uh, which is right. When we kind of started talking about it a little bit further, we kind of talked with DLGF, um, and they really considered this a home-ruled fund, and I think that's, we kind of missed that little bit of an understanding. And they want all the home-ruled funds to be done just like you would do like an additional appropriation, those kinds of things, so it's going to follow those uh, requirements. They have a memo 
out that talks about it. Let's see if I can tell you where it is. I think we weren't considering it a home rule fund. And I think that's where our, our confusion kind of came. We were think, you know, thinking of it as a grant fund. And where's it at? OK. It is. It's a memorandum, additional appropriation submission, department review procedures, and related topics. And it came out February 5th of this year. All right, so um, in it, they talk about additional appropriation procedures for home ruled funds require a public notice, a public hearing, and reporting to DLGF. And I can't read the rest of that because my picture's in the way. Move it. All right. And the ARPA fund is considered a home ruled fund for DLGF purposes. Okay. So I do apologize for that confusion. That was just kind of a misunderstanding um, that we had. So I know that, you know, what we originally said was just local, but please, please see that memo. Please follow the procedures through DLGF. Okay, so we're looking, you should have your separate fund, so we're looking that all the costs are accounted for inside the separate fund. Again, they're not commingled, all right? Um, should be appropriated through that fund, should be spent through that fund. We're looking for internal controls. We're always looking for internal controls. So again, um, you know, over that, what is being spent out of that fund? Um, has people, have have we looked at it? Have we determined that it's appropriate? Okay, we're looking for all of that. Um, the documentation and explanation of the costs and compliance with Treasury guidance. So, I mean, we do get a lot of calls. Can I buy X? We can't really tell you, yes, you can go buy X, because X normally, there's a lot of other factors involved with these purchases that we have to take into consideration. And until you've actually made that purchase and actually done that, and we've come in and looked at it from an audit perspective and gathered it, that's the only time we can really look at it and say, mm, we think this meets it or we don't think it meets it. If you're really questioning something, Department of Treasury. If you get something from them and where they say, oh, absolutely, that meets it, keep that documentation so we can look at it, okay, um, when we come in to do the audit. But we, let's be honest, these, you know, the ARP, it's, it's broad. It's pretty broad. So we are looking that everything you guys are purchasing and spending out of here is documented with a determination of how it meets that, okay? And again, we're also looking at those uniform compliance requirements um, inside that supplement that we were talking about a, a little bit ago. Okay. All right. Um, so there are 12 compliance, um, 12 compliance requirements to federal programs. I didn't list all of them here. Um, but for this one, we think, and again, right now, this is still just preliminary. We think that these up here are the ones that are really going to apply, the main ones. We're not saying there's not going to be additional. It's just these are the ones we're scoping out at the time. We're looking for activities allowed or unallowed. We're looking for allowable costs. Um, we're looking for equipment, real property management, so your purchases that you're doing uh, with any kind of equipment. Uh, period of performance, like we talked about again, there's, you know, is there the time frame in between there? Procurement and suspension and demarment, there are rules that apply for all of that, so we'll look into that. Any reporting that you need to get done, um, did you file the appropriate reporting? And then there's probably going to be some special tests and provisions. Um, this is different for every grant, I don't know what those are as of yet, I'm not, not even sure that they know what those are as of yet. Um, but they'll just be really, really specific and unique to this grant. So anytime you see special tests and provisions, they are extremely unique. 
So we talked about that compliance supplement. I went ahead and put the link here, and there's kind of a, I put a little picture of the, of the front screen down there so you can kind of see it, because it is available to you guys. You can look at it. It's huge. <laughs> if you've never looked at it, it can be a little overwhelming um, at times. But it's there. It's a reference. Um, I don't think this is linked on our website anywhere. Lori, I don't think, right? I don't think it is either. So, uh, but that is the website. Sorry, I have all these little windows on my screen. I know you guys can't see them, but. Okay. So I don't have a ton of time, but we'll go over a few, some few updates. So again, any updates we do are gonna be on the website. Uh, any memos we come out with will be right there on the website. I think underneath the ARP, we have a link to the treasury site, which if you go, that has the link to the portal that you guys can get into. Um, We've got our directive that's out there. We do have an accounting processes memo. Uh, we got some additional information on interest earned. Uh, so we have a memo on that. And Lori and um, Susan Gordon, who's another director um, in our office, sometimes they get stuck with, <laughs> stuck with stuff because they work on Fridays. <laughs> Sorry. And so they were kind enough to put together a revenue um, loss calculation video um, just to kind of go through trying to make it as simple as you can. We get it. It's a big undertaking. I, I'm going to assume everybody's pretty much done the first round, right? Um, I see. It. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know that there's been a lot of guidance out there. There's some other revenue loss calculators um, that are available, but these things are all available on our website. And if anything new comes out, like, you know, we've, we sent questions in. Obviously, like, the interest earned was a huge question. It took them a while to get back to us. But if something like that comes up, we'll keep submitting. If they give a response or they, you know, add to the FAQs on their website, that interim final rules out there, um, be aware of it. I mean, we'll will keep you guys in the know as things change. So we did put out the accounting processes memo um, early on. I can't remember when we exactly put that one out, but we updated it in May. It was kind of around the time we did the quads, around that time, and so we didn't really focus a whole lot on it because it was, well, we'd already kind of planned <laughs> for the quads. So I just want to go over a few things that were added to that memo. All right. So one of the things were grants um, and programs to respond to the public health emergency or negative, you know, impacts. Um, basically, one of the things that we added here is that there needs to be, again, a written agreement between the recipient. So if you're giving it to somebody like a fire department who's um, you know, doing something, you're giving them some grant money through all of that, there should be a written agreement with them. Uh, the disbursements to them, to whoever you're granting the money to, um, must be documented and in compliance with the written agreement. Okay, so we're looking for all that documentation inside there. Um, really need to assess whether the program or the service responds to the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, it requires the recipient to first identify a need or negative impact of COVID-19 public health emergency, and secondly, identify how the program, service, and other intervention addresses the identified need or impact. Okay, so um, you need to make that determination if that's going to, if you're going to give it, what's that program made up of? We want, we want to see that documentation included, you know, with the written agreement. Records need to be maintained uh, to support the assessment of how businesses or business districts are, you know, are receiving assistance, um, how they were affected by negative uh, economic impacts of the pandemic, and how the aid uh, provided response, response to the impact. Sorry, I need a drink. got a piece of ice, I'm sorry. Okay. Premium pay has been a diff 
been a big one. I can't tell you who is going to qualify for premium pay. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, but I think her hotel room, right there, PA, right? Your hotel room, you guys are going to talk about that later. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, so what I want to draw your attention to is that if um, you're going to include premium, main, cre premium pay, you need to maintain documentation and explanation that the premium pay meets the definitions and requirements um, of the act itself and the interim final rule. There is a lot to this one, guys. So... Um, I will tell you, like, here's just a few things out of the interim final rule. So, in providing premium pay to essential workers or grants to eligible employers, a recipient must consider whether the pay or grant would respond to the worker or workers performing essential work. I mean, it's very, very long. Um, this premium pay should prioritize compensation of those of lower income eligible workers that perform essential work. This is all inside the interim final rule. One thing that I thought might be helpful when you're making your determinations is to know the definitions of these. Um, I tried to put inside, if it says the section 602, that's the act itself. If it says IFR, that's the interim final rule. So go look those up, know them, make your determinations, document your determinations, and explain how, if you're paying premium pay, how it fits here. Um, you know, I mean, these definitions are just really important. We saw, you know, on the previous slide, um, that documentation and explanation. So, you know, it, what you do need to remember is it's not a bonus. Um, it truly is to help individuals who are on the front line. I did pull some of this stuff out. Like, I'm just going to say this. I hate touch pads on laptops. I normally turn mine off and I have a separate mouse. So when you see me up here struggling, it's because I've hit something and I end up way down on the screen and I have to come back up. So I apologize. You know, so premium pay, the way that it was defined in here is it means an amount of up to $13 per hour that's paid to an eligible worker. In addition to wages and remuneration, um, the eligible worker otherwise receives for all work performed by the eligible worker during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Such amount may not exceed $25,000 with respect to any single eligible worker. The eligible worker, the term means those workers needed to maintain continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure sectors and additional sectors as each chief executive officer of a metropolitan city, non-entitlement unit of local government or county may designate as critical to protect the health and well-being of their residents. Essential workers, those workers needed to maintain continuity of operations of essential critical infrastructure sectors and additional sectors as each governor of a state or territory or each tribal government may designate as critical to protect the health and well-being of the residents. Oh, and there it went again. Okay. All right, I should just sign out there, okay. And the essential critical infrastructure sectors. These sectors include healthcare, public health and safety, childcare, education, sanitation, transportation, uh, food production and services, among others. I think there's some more in 602G2 and 603G2, okay? So, again, they're technical, but you need to know them. You need to document how, when you're paying premium pay, how, you know, it agrees with all of the definitions and is in compliance with the act itself. Yes. Hold on. Where's she at? Oh. 
If you're online and you're putting questions in, we're, we're trying to get there. It's just in the back of the room. If we do premium pay, do we have to change our wage and salary ordinance? Well, is, are you giving them additional pay? Yes. So yes, it needs to be included. Okay, what, could you give us an example of the documentation that w we would use to support our determination that these workers are eligible workers for premium pay? For example, I have read the internal, I mean the interim final mm -hmm. rule, and I've decided as auditor that the maintenance workers qualify. They meet all of those bullet points. And so the council decides we'll give those workers, those maintenance workers, custodians, Right. workers, premium pay. What's the documentation? Um, just job descriptions or a resolution that says these are the reasons why or? I, I think if you had just it's a my detailed, logic. Right. yeah, like a detailed of their job descriptions, what are they doing? What qualifies them in your mind that they are a frontline worker or that they meet that? That's what we're looking for. I mean, there's no set, set thing that needs to be there, but we just want to know what you considered when you were looking at it. Not that, you know what, we, Sam over there does a really great job and I think he needs a the bonus. Things we have heard is like, if you just go across the board, we're giving everybody a rate, we're giving everybody a bonus. That's not documentation. There has to be some supporting. They need to, this is why we're giving everybody a bonus. Right. And that everybody falls in and that everybody was not remote and that everything. You, know, you have to think about it, it can't just be, it can't just be a blanket, give let's out. give it to everybody, absolutely. So Without what, oh, okay, so what format, just like a memo, or does it need to be a resolution that's passed by the council? I don't think it has to be a resolution or anything like that. It doesn't have to be that formal. So just, I mean, it's going to be different county per county, but we just want to see it. So whether or not that's a Word document you typed up, make sure it's legible, don't write it in a notebook cursively and hand it to me, and I'm like, I don't know. Um, so... You know, it's going to be different to each, but if you want to brainstorm on it, um, if you're in the middle of doing it, you know, Lauren, I'll be happy to talk to you about it and make sure that, you know, we think that you're including everything that's documentation. 